Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Amy. Amy is here to talk about her life. She's got a lot going on. She is married to her wife. They got married shortly after it became legal for them, and they are foster parents of a mixed family, so she's got a lot of different things, a lot of people in her life, a lot of different life experiences, and she also works in HR in higher education, so I'm really excited that she is here to share a little bit about her life with us, so thank you, Amy, so much. Why don't you go ahead and say hello and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Um, hi, my name's Amy, um, and as Sarah said, I am married to a black woman, and we have three adopted children. Uh, the oldest is white, the middle child is black, and the youngest is mixed. And um, it's just been an interesting journey from coming out at a much later age in life, and um, and then navigating the diversity of our family. Along with my job, I'm also the D- diversity, equity, and inclusion co-lead at my um, in my unit at work in human resources. And um, I don't know, lots of lots of interesting life experiences. I think that led me to this point where I am. Great. Now, you know, so you mentioned you have three kids, and we were talking a little bit earlier that you have fostered a lot of kids. So, can you talk a little bit? about how you got into the fostering lifestyle and and what got you then into adopting three kids? Sure. So I think back in 2008, um, at that time I was single and I had been with somebody who really wasn't interested in having children. And I, I thought to myself at the time, you know, that was fine. I was fine with not having children. Um, I enjoyed the single lifestyle. And then all of a sudden I was not okay with it anymore. And I realized I wasn't going to wait until I had somebody else to start a family. I was on vacation with family, family vacation um, with my siblings and my parents and, you know, all their children were there and I did not have anybody else but myself. And I, and I just had this ache in my heart and I always knew as a little kid, um, just like I knew I was going to go to college, I just always had this sense that someday I was going to get married and have two kids and adopt two kids. Um, and I just had this sense uh, of responsibility or obligation that there were so many children in the world that needed a safe place to live, um, that needed to be taken care of, that didn't have the things that I had growing up. So I wanted to be able to, to provide that. And so fast forward 2008, I'm at this point not in a relationship. Um, I felt like I've been putting my life on hold. So that's when I just reached out to a foster care agency, literally the week after I came back from this family vacation and um, started the process. And six months later, I was, um, I became a licensed foster parent. And then probably a month after that, I was placed with uh, my first two, two children. And I've um, uh, fostered them for like, I, I want to say probably six months and they went back home, which is part of the process. Um, you get attached to, kid, to foster kids and it's really, really hard to let them go. Um, but that attachment is one of the most important parts of the process because sometimes that attachment could be the only attachment that that child has experienced in their life, like a real deep attachment. And and I just want to add this caveat. I, by no means, am I an expert on foster care. I can only relate my own personal experiences with it. And um, it was just, it's just been an amazing journey. And then after, after um, those two went home, then I got my oldest, who, who, is, who I later adopted, but he was a newborn baby. And, you know, I mentioned in my introduction the diversity of my family. But in the county that I lived in, it was really I the the highest need, the greatest need was minority kids. And um so my first two they were they were both um black 
boys and uh, welcome them into my home. And, and so then the next child that they called me about was a newborn white baby boy. And I thought, I honestly, you know, and I, and I don't, I don't talk about this a lot, but I really wrestled with, do I want as a white woman, do I want to have a white baby boy? Because I thought there's so many people who are just waiting. I mean, I was in these support groups and there were people that have just, they were just like on a list for seven years waiting for a newborn white baby boy. And I thought I, I went into this because I wanted to have to serve a greater need. Right. And, but you're just in a queue. Like I had an opening, they had a need. So they called me for this placement. So I, I took him and I, and 11 months later adopted him. And I'm just like, my heart was full. I mean, I was just so glad I fell in love with him immediately. I'd never had a newborn baby. You know, I, it was just a very different experience from having the first two were eight and four. And then I go directly to a newborn, which is very unusual. I might add, it's not a from in my experience. And then, um, and then when he got a little bit older, I, um, I got a little girl and then she went back to stay with her sister. And then, um, I did some respite care for, and that is for children. Um, a lot of times the court system, they have the hearings, uh, where they, re where they may remove children from a home at the end of the day. So a lot of times you'll get a call between four, you know, after four o'clock in the afternoon. And if they don't get a placement that night, um, sometimes the children may end up going to a group home or something just until they can find a placement. And that just killed me, the idea of this, uh, of a child not having a place to go to. So, um, cause they're already terrified, right? They, their world has just completely been ripped apart because they don't know what's going on. They don't know why the police came. They don't know why child protective services came to their home and whisked them away in the car. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that we experience with uh, foster parenting. And a lot of times, I would say probably eight out of the 10 times or nine out of the 10 times, uh, the children are reunited with their parents, um, their biological parent, parent or parents. Um, but in, in this case, I want to mention the first two that I had, like two weeks after I got um, Sebastian, he, uh, they called me and said, the older two have been, per the these other two that you had have been permanently, parental rights have been permanently terminated. And since you were the only foster parent um, that uh, took care of them, you have, you know, they always go to the foster parent first before they try to find um, somebody else for them to live with. And I, it was the most gut-wrenching decision, Sarah. It was so hard to say no, because I was single. I was working full-time. I was in grad school. I had a newborn baby. And then to have a now nine and a four-year-old and a newborn, I just, oh, it was awful. And I, and it makes me sad to this day to think about it, but I had to say, no, I couldn't, I couldn't take them back. And, and being a foster parent is there's a lot of hard decisions that you have to make. And that was one of the hardest I ever had to make. And it was just, it's still, uh, I'm trying not to, it's still, it's still hard. And I'm trying not to cry, but because I, I worry about them and I wonder how they're doing. Um, I wonder about all the kids that I fostered, how they're doing. Anyways, that's, that's one of the stories um, that I have about foster parenting. Yeah. And it's, so honorable to hear like your goal was just to help children in need. It, it was much more about them than it was about you. Like, yes, you wanted children, you know, you wanted to have a family, but, you know, to hear that you were even, you know, struggling to, to accept, you know, the, the one child just because he was white, because you were like, I know people want a white baby and, and here I am, you know, that was not you know necessarily my goal or whatever. Um, so it's, it's great to hear, um, just kind of that experience that, that you've had now, I, I can only imagine what it's like to hear, like, you know, these children need a home and you, you had them, but now you can't take them in the foster community, just because I, I don't know a lot about the foster community. Are you able to keep in touch with any of the children at all after they go back? Or is it kind of a, once they go, either go back 
to the a parent or parents or they go back into the system that you just you know you no longer have contact um yeah it's at least in our state um in a, in our co- county you no longer have contact because we didn't um you have parental visits so you so sometimes you may exchange phone numbers with the um by the birth parent, the biological parent. Um, but typically it's all done through the caseworker because, uh, you know, n- n- we've had people knock on our, on our door, uh, look, looking for their child. Um, somehow they got our address or they followed, you know, there's stories about that because as you can imagine, um, most people are not happy if their child is taken from them. Right. So it's a very it's a very traumatic, emotional experience. So a lot of times the caseworker is the intermediary. So, you know, we 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 just want them to know that we're loving and taking care of and keeping their child safe. Well, whatever it is that they have to do, classes, therapy, um, drug screening, whatever, whatever it is that they have to do to get their life back together so that they can um, be in a better place to receive their to have their child come back home. That's what our primary goal is as foster parents. So um, typically once that relationship has ended and they go back home, you know, unless you connected on Facebook at some point earlier, there's really no way to keep in, in touch because they're, we don't like, we don't know what their permanent address is, their home address. We don't have phone numbers. We just, sometimes we check with the agency and we say, you know, we were thinking about so-and-so the other day, you know, how's everything going? And they, for privacy reasons, they really can't share. So it's hard. You just, you just know that for the year, the six months, however long they were in your home, you loved them, you made them feel safe, you gave them some uh, building blocks, some comfort, um, and you, and you send them back out in the world, send them back home. And you, and you hope that you made a difference. And we, when I first went into it, I, I chose the zero to five age range because I had done a lot of reading, a lot of research on this. Um, and the brain, and I don't remember the numbers now, but it's like the brain is 80% developed by the age, age five. So all the neurons that all the, you know, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the very bottom, the very bottom section, a lot of children in foster care. Have, don't have. They don't have that sense of safety. They don't have food security. They don't have a safe place to live. Um, and so those are the things that you that are really important in those developing years of a child's brain. And so that to me, I thought, well, I want to have the biggest impact, right? I just want to make a difference in these children's lives so that when they go back home, that they had some, some of that um, built into their into their reserves. And um, later, uh, when I was working at um, a a utility, I I met a director of the diversity at the time. And I didn't know, like, you can't look at somebody and say, oh, you were a foster child or you were adopted, right? And he, and when he learned that I was a foster parent and that I was doing this, he, um, pulled me off to the side one day and he said, I would just want you to know that I was a foster child and I bumped around from house to house to house, from home to home to home. And, and I, he said, I can tell you, you always remember the good ones. They make a difference. Don't ever doubt that no matter how short a time that they were in your home, that you had an impact because you did, you, you are making a difference. And that, oh my God, that, that just just reinvigorated me to want to keep doing this. And I said, I, I fostered 14 kids over the years. So um, it's been, you know, that's what I tell people, no matter how hard it is, just know that you've made a difference, even, even for a short period of time. So that's, that's what keeps me going. And that's, that's why um, I was excited when my wife, Kelly, you know, who, when we first got together, didn't really want, you know, children. She'd been living a very happy life as a single person or in a relationship. And, you know, all the freedom that comes with it, the travel, the the going out to eat, all this stuff. 
that you have when you don't have um, the responsibility of children. And, uh, but she fell in love with me. So therefore she fell in love with Sebastian. And um, as time went on, you know, I didn't push it because, I, you know, she just, she needed to come to this decision herself. And then she decided that she was ready, that um, being a parent was kind of, kind of neat. And so then we, so then we just, oh, we got licensed again because we have to be, you have to be licensed as whoever, all the adults in the home have to be licensed, at least in our state. And um, so we did that. And then we got a couple more placements and, um, you know, we didn't go into it expecting to adopt. Like I never went into it expecting to adopt. I thought, well, maybe eventually after 10 years or something, maybe I'll get a placement. So I was just shocked um, that at my, my second placement, my third child, I was available to be adopted. So um, it's been an interesting, um, interesting journey. Now, are you still fostering children uh, as needed or because you now have three children in the home, you aren't? Yeah, excellent question. So the, the foster care license um, renews every couple of years. And so we were due for a renewal uh, in August of 2020. Okay, so up to that point, the pandemic had started, you know, it, earlier in the year, and we were so freaked out. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. We, I, me especially, was just freaked out about exposure. Um, we, our, our kids were home uh, from school. I was, I was home from work, working from home re, uh, remotely, and we hunkered down. We didn't go anywhere except you know, to get the bare minimum groceries. And, and that was always a pickup orders. So the idea of bringing a child into our home where we didn't know where they came from or what they've been exposed to. And we were like, would it really be, it would be awful to quarantine them in their room. You know, welcome to our house, stay in this room. We're going to slide food under the door, right? It was just, it, we just said, oh God, we can't do that. We can't do that to somebody. And we have to protect our family. and. You know, this was in the early days of the pandemic, um, and Michigan was just like through the roof, and and we were like the, one of the top uh, places, a really hot, high number of uh, infections and cases. And so, as we get closer to August, I'm you know I'm getting all my training in. I you know I've got all my because you have to do annual training to get uh, like con like continuing education credits. You have to to remain certified as a foster parent and. And Kelly's not doing that so much, but I'm getting it all in. I'm going doing this trauma training and all this stuff. And then the caseworker wants to come to our house because they have to do a visit. And Kelly and I, we just sit down and we just have this real heart to heart talk. And we just decided um, that we weren't going to renew our, our license at this time. So we so we put a pause on it. You know, we have three kids, we have a small house. Um, our youngest is now three and he came to us as a, also as a newborn, he was two days old. He went back at about two months, came back, um, two months later and has been ours ever since and we adopted him. But, um, yeah, so, so we're taking a pause, I guess we're taking a pause. If we have a bigger house, maybe we'll, we'll do it again. Or once the pandemic's over and. I know there's kids out there that need it. And so like, I feel like I want to do it, right? I just, but it's just, it's a scary time right now. And I feel like it's like a wuss for saying that. But you know? it's, everyone's been handling the pandemic differently and, you know, you've been handling it responsibly. And so the fact that, you know, your license was expiring, you know, it just kind of, the time was coming because, you know, if you had gotten a call, um, and your license was still active and, and to have to go through that panic of, well, like the kid needs to quarantine, how are we going to handle this? So it, you know, especially 2020 was a year, I think a lot of people were looking at their mental health, um, yeah. like how that, how you would have really responded to that. So I think that makes sense. Um, and, you know, and, and as you're calling it, it's a pause, you know, a bigger house, you know, later, no pandemic, <laughs> you know, and anything can, can still happen. So 
You mentioned, of course, that Kelly uh, did not want children at first. And then, you know, because she loves you, everything has since worked out. So what what was it like um, when you first, you know, met her and, you know, coming out later in life, realizing you were gay? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, Sure. So uh, I think I was uh, 27 when I realized that um, it's like, I was in a relationship and, um, and with a man and I'll share that, uh, I was in a relation, I was married to a man and I just, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. He just amazing guy. Um, but I just, there was, it's hard to describe. There was like this emptiness that he couldn't fill through no fault of his own. And, and it was really growing up. I didn't have any, any role models. I always felt a little different. I just, I never had any role models for, or examples of anybody gay in my life. So I just, you know, I just didn't know, right? Like I didn't know what I didn't know. I grew up in a small town in Maine and um, I didn't know anybody gay in my school or on TV. I mean, I just didn't have any exposure to it. So um, when I got older and then I went, when I was in college, I, you know, in college, I was at big advocate for, I used to wear um, uh, pins and marches, doing marches and all kinds of stuff, advocating for um, uh, LGBTQ. Of course, I wasn't called LGBTQ at the time, but, uh, you know, lesbian, gay rights and um, racial injustice. And I was really involved, politically active in college. I was uh, president of our uh, Amnesty International chapter on campus. And so I was just really involved in all this stuff in um, and I had a wide variety of friends, but I ne- never looked inward like that's me too, right? I just, I don't know. I think, I, I guess I can't even guess. Maybe I'd need therapy to try to identify why I didn't, why I didn't know, you know? Um, but when I was, when I was older and I, I grew up knowing, like I said before, that I was going to get married and have children and, you know, blah, 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 just the it was just the stereotypical um, middle class, lower middle class value system, right? I was going to go to college. I always knew I was going to go to college. Why? I don't know. My parents went to college. My dad was the only one in his family who went to college, the first one. Um, Why did I have that? My parents instilled that value in me, I guess. So I just thought, well, this is what you do. You go to college, you get married and you have kids, right? So That was my thought. And then as I'm married to this absolutely amazingly wonderful man, um, I just thought something doesn't feel right. Just something doesn't feel right. And I didn't, it was just, you know, I talk about, there's some watershed moments in everybody's life, I think. And and realizing that I was gay and having to tell him was one of the most painful experiences of my life. And it was such a pivotal moment for me because it's like, I, I didn't, I didn't, my whole life just turned upside down because I remember when I got married, my father, love you, dad. But my father was like, this is the best decision you've ever made in your life. You know, he's a wonderful man. You know, you get he's financially, you're going to be, you know, stable and all this stuff. And he was just like, you know, good job, honey. You know, <laughs> and, and I, and so I thought, oh, I'm just going to let all these people down. I'm letting my family down. And I, you know, how do I tell them and all of this stuff? So it was just a really, really um, traumatic time and for me. And it was, it was liberating in some senses, but I was just worried about all this other family stuff. And it took me like seven months before I even told my parents, like nobody knew why I was divorced. And I don't think I told anybody until like way after the fact. I was um, just afraid of the fallout from my family because, um, you know, weddings are such a big deal. And I was the youngest of four and um, and I raised Catholic. And so um, I write this letter to my parents and I'm telling them, you know, I I know that, you know, I, I know this may hurt you and I know you don't really understand it, but I'm divorced from Mark and oh yeah, I'm, I'm gay. And, um, you know, I, I love you, and I, but I understand that if you don't, and I said this in the letter, I, I wonder if they still have it because I wish I'd made a copy, but just for 
just a historical uh, uses. But I said, you know, I understand if you if you can't accept this, and and but the, and that's okay. But you, you will not be part of my life if you can't accept it. And because I I I needed to to surround myself with with people where I felt loved and safe, right? And oh, what an awful thing to say to your parents. I, I in hindsight, but I was like really. Like, I need this. If you can't accept it, then I don't want your negativity in my life, right? I just don't want that. So I get a letter back. I don't know how long I get this letter back. And they say, well, um, our religion, you know, our our faith, we love you. We don't accept it. We don't really believe that this is who you are, but you're our daughter and we love you, right? So it was, it was better than I expected. It was... You know, and I, I haven't really talked about it. It's funny we're talking about this now, but I haven't really talked about that with my parents because now they're wonderful. You know, they they love my wife. They love their their grandchildren. They um, they may not have always approved of every decision I made in my life, but they've they've been you know they've been wonderful. And there was a time for a while there where you know I didn't go visit them. I didn't. I just didn't want to insert myself into that uncomfortable situation. And that was my choice, but um, you know, it's all, it's, it's way better now. You know, it's just, it's, we all got older, right? We all, we all matured. We all got older. I was um, not so like, you can't be in my life. Right. Um, But it's just, so that was my, that was part of my journey. And then, you know, I was with somebody for 14 years um, and as I mentioned, uh, I think maybe when we talked earlier, she didn't want children. Um, and I thought I was okay with that until I realized I wasn't. And then, um, and then when Kelly and I got together, she she fell in love with me and I had a, and I had a little boy, I had a little son. Um, and so she, she struggled, I think. And, um, she's, well, not, I think, I know she struggled a lot with, did she want to be a parent? And I had to give her that space and that time because, you know, I was in love with her and it would have killed me if she decided that being a parent was too much, like not part of the deal. And um, I know she struggled with that decision and she talked to her family, she talked to her mom and her sister and, um, and she really struggled with that. And ultimately she decided, she determined that her love for me outweighed everything else. And, um, and then much to my surprise, she decided she wanted to, you know, become a foster parent too. So that was, um, that was just a wonderful thing. And so we, we became foster parents again, or again, for me, first time for her. And, um, I don't think she was prepared for the gut wrenching part when you love them and then they go home. Oh. And um, and so then Gabe, uh, our son now Gabriel, who's now three, um, he was our, I think our third placement. And then she's like, I don't know if I can do this again. This is really hard. But I convinced her, um, you know, when he came back to us, we're like, okay, um, we're good. You know, he came back to us and then we were able to adopt him. Um, you know, which is, I I need to say it's very bittersweet when you ad- ad- adopt a child from foster care because you love that child, but then you know that that child, that his mother, his father, somewhere out there, his birth parents are hurting because they no longer have that that child. So I just, I don't want to make it sound like, um, it, it, it's, it's bittersweet. I don't even know how else to describe it because you know, you know that somebody else's loss was your gain, right? Somebody, somebody gave birth to this child that now is part of your family. And that, that, that I wouldn't call it a gift because more than likely they didn't do it willingly, but um, that, that passing, I, I just hope that they know that all three of our children's parents, birth parents know that we love their children and we're taking care of them and protecting them and keeping them safe. And I hope that that gives them some peace.
Yeah, it definitely sounds bittersweet, like you said. Um, but you know, you're giving them the life that they that they need, and and I think that that's so important. Now, what was it like um, in 2015 when gay marriage became legal? Um, what was that change like for you and Kelly? Oh wow, yeah, that was um, that was an incredible moment. That was an absolutely incredible. Um, and we, I mean, we literally, we, we rushed to try to find some place where we could get married. And, um, you know, in hindsight, we wish we'd taken a little bit more time, but we were so afraid that, um, that something was going to happen and that, that right would be taken away. So we just, we got, we found some local place, some local, uh, chapel and, um, had a, had a service done and, um, and our oldest was was there and we invited some friends and it was just a really small, quickly put together uh, event. And we keep saying, you know, at some point, maybe we'll just we'll, we'll like reaffirm our vows in a, in a more traditional sense. But we um, it was it was incredibly exciting, but also scary because we didn't know what kind of backlash there would be. And we didn't know. Um, like it, it, it felt very tenuous, like we didn't know if it was going to be revoked or overturned or or something it just you just have that anxiety because you'd been waiting so long um at that point that we got married um because we because we couldn't be because we weren't legally married we were worried about sebastian the oldest um at the time so we went through we had a have a living trust that we paid to protect um, Kelly, if something happened to me, uh, so that she would be entr uh, entrusted with the child without, you just never know how family is going to react, right? So we just wanted to make sure that we had protections in place, that financially, um, that my retirement and all of the benefits that I have would, would translate to her or to our son. So we had that trust in place. And then, um, when we got married, we finally felt that we were protected, like for real, because it, 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 we had the recognition, the social security benefits, the, the inheritance, like if something happens to me, we don't have to worry just like my parents or your parents. We don't have to worry about um, things going through probate, that she would have access to my benefits and vice versa, right? Um, so that safety and security, what a load off our mind. It's not, uh, it's the things that everybody else takes for granted. It's not special rights. You know, there was always this big brouhaha in, um, about special rights. Oh, gays want special rights. We don't want special rights. I just don't want to be kicked out of my house or kicked out of my, you know, rentals apartment because I love a woman, right? That's, how is that a special right? It's not special, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. that, that always confounded me. It's like, how is that special? The, the protections that you take for granted every single day, just by being a heterosexual person. And then you think that I want special rights? That, anyways, so now we have the equal rights, right? I mean, it is kind of funny. It's looking back now, you know, every city or town or, County, you know, had these little civil rights ordinances and things like that. And um, and I just remember all the propaganda that was anti this, uh, anti gay rights. And and it just, it's like, how could you hate me so much? And you don't even know me, you know, nothing about me, but you hate me so much that you want to change the constitution to prevent me from having the same rights as you, right? And so um, anyway, so when marriage was legalized, it was just, another one of those watershed moments, a pivotal moment in my life that really, you know, you could just, it was this collective sigh of relief, right? Um, to be able to know that we're protected, that our children are protected. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what it was. It, it was no little thing, obviously. <laughs> right, of, of course it wasn't little, very, very big moment. And hopefully, you know, pandemic aside, you know, you can do something uh, of a vow renewal uh, to have a bigger party or, or whatever it may be. Um, 
And and you're right. I think it is something that a lot of people take for granted. Um, it it gets complicated when when you're not married. And I I'm not in a gay relationship, but I don't have a will yet and it's something that I need to do because I live with my boyfriend. I own this home. I mean, of course there's a mortgage on it, but it's it's, you know, it's it's complicated and for so many people to not have had those simple rights. Um I've seen a lot since Kamala Harris became the vice president things that she could not do because whether it was her race or her gender and like a history of like pe- previous presidents or vice presidents and when things happened. So there yeah. are people who are still alive who couldn't even open a bank account because there are women. And that just, it just baffles me that, that people who are still living um, did experience that. Yeah. Yeah. It's intense. So, you know, you, you mentioned your your wife is black, you have a black child, a white child, a mixed child. What has your experience been um, with the diversity of your family? So I guess it depends upon who you're around. Um, uh, there have been times when, like as a as a foster parent or if I'm out with um my black son, sometimes people will look at you. Uh, and sometimes I hear, you know, these are my personal experiences. I just want to put that caveat out there. I'm not saying that all people react to that, but there is some, I've experienced some cultural response from the black community that, you know, I've heard comments when I've been in, in line at the grocery store. You know, who do you think you are? You think, you know, uh, who, or who does she think she is? Um, that 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 child needs to be with a black family or needs to be with this black mama or something like that. And um, and conversely, when when Kelly would go out with Sebastian out to the store, or whatever she would, people would say, "Oh, are you his nanny? Like, are you the babysitter?" Like people assumed that. That an an older black woman with a, I mean not old but older black woman with a with a young child, couldn't be his mother, so. So we've had those experiences, but now that we live um, uh, near Ann Arbor, we're, we're in Ypsilanti, which is racially diverse, and of course Ann Arbor with the University of Michigan is incredibly racially diverse. You know, it's it's not a it's not a thing. It's not it's occasionally it is. Occasion, I should say occasionally it is Kelly experiences more things than I do. Like when she's picking up the kids from school or something, she will, she will get comments or, or, um, because she's, Kelly is just incredibly friendly and out and outgoing. And, and, um, she will like other kids, like if you go into the classroom with little kids and you pick them up at the end of the day, or if there's a party or something, they'll be like, um, are, are you really Sebastian's mom? Like this is, this is when they were younger. Um, you know, well, how come you're, how come you don't have the same, you know, how come he's, you have brown skin, right? Like they would ask those questions and then, but then other parents would become, might become uncomfortable that these kids were embracing her as being the black mother of a white child, right? So each generation, I think, becomes less concerned with skin color. And our children are, even though they notice the the difference Um, my oldest was at a, like, when you walked into his school, there was a sign on the wall that said 21 different languages spoken here. I mean, he, we, what's one of the reasons why we moved to this area is we wanted our children to be exposed to the diversity of the world and the diversity of our values. And, um, so, uh, I may have wandered a little too far from your question, but I, (laughs) because I tend to do that, but, uh. Yeah, so we do encounter some, but when we go out as a family, I, I don't know, I don't know if anybody, people may think, oh, uh, Kelly is the mom of Jeremiah and Amy is the mom of Sebastian and and Gabriel is just, you know, in between or something. Like people may not necessarily assume that we're like a, one family unit and that's okay. It's like, you know, we just, 
live and let live, right? We don't, we don't judge you, don't judge us kind of thing. Yeah. And what do you do at your job? Um, you mentioned that part of your position has to do with um, diversity and equity. So can you explain a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so I'm working human resources for the University of Michigan, and um, which is a huge organization. And for the last uh, five years, we've had this, this major, we got a new president, a university president. We've had this major push towards, um, you know, as leaders and best, which is the University of Michigan's tagline, one of them, leaders, leaders and best. You know, we realized that um, the university needed to really be much more proactive about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion at all levels, not just from the student perspective, but also faculty and staff. And um, a, a five-year plan was developed, and um, and so my unit is one of the facilities and operations is one of the largest units on campus, the largest number of employees in one in one unit. And I became the co-lead with um, with one of my coworkers to help lead the the effort. On, cam- on in our unit on campus. I just want to remind you, we have 1,700 in our unit, but there's like 40,000 faculty and staff, right? So um, my role is small, relatively speaking. But uh, so in so we are one of the one of my responsibilities is to is to uh, provide resources and to be a resource for the departments within our unit as far as um, you know videos and um, podcasts and book recommendations and and um, little trainings. And part of my job as um, an HR uh, professional is I co-teach a a class called Ouch That Stereotype Hurts. And um, it's it's based on a book called Ouch That Stereotype Hurts. And we we have, it was a four hour class and we've kind of pared it down to a two hour class. And now we do it part of orientation. We teach this class as part of orientation for every new employee that comes into facilities and operations. So um, there's a real focus. We now have it as part of our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is now part of our performance reviews. Like, what have you done to help promote it? And for our staff, and it's a role that is obviously very important to me because my whole family is very is very diverse. Um, and our unit of facilities and operations is also very diverse. So um, it's just a, it's a role that I've had uh, for, I don't think like for four of the five years, we're going into uh, like, we're calling it DEI 2.0, we're doing an evaluation year, and then we're moving into uh, a, new, a new plan of how we can, you know, what lessons did we learn over the last five years? What can we do better? What areas do we need to focus on? And uh, it's just, it's been a really, it's an exciting part of my role. I really uh, value being a part of that because again, my, I, I wanna be a part of making a difference. I wanna, I wanna be a change agent. And so this helps fulfill that part of me that needs to affect some change. So just like, just like as a little kid, I knew I wanted to make a difference with, uh, with children and be, be, then that became a foster, turned into being a foster parent. It's also in my job as an, as an HR uh, lead, I want to make a difference with the employees and have, an, have a positive impact. And these diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, being a co-lead, I, I get to have that impact as well. Yeah. And again, like you, you're doing it for all the right reasons. Now, you said that it's part of the performance evaluation for people to be talking about diversity and inclusion and what they're doing. Can you explain a little bit how that works? Because I think when people typically think of performance evaluations, they think about, you know, your day-to-day duties. Are you meeting goals? What are you doing? So can you explain how that works for your unit? So um, this is also, I, I believe it's becoming part of now, I'm not trying to be a spokesman, spokesperson for the university, but um, but I believe that this is also something that university wide for faculty and staff they're trying to get DEI incorporated into performance reviews. So our our unionized staff, the bargain for staff, they don't have performance reviews at 
ours don't have performance reviews. Uh, so, but they, they're still expected to participate and we still, you know, bring stuff out to those areas as well. But for our non bargain for staff, uh, it's on the performance review, such as, so it's there to reflect the values of the university, to reflect the values of the division, to, to stress that in addition to having these uh, core competencies for performance, we also want you to have the, comp the core competencies of being able to uh, promote the value of collaboration, of uh, being a proactive problem solver, of, of um, being respectful. And part of being respectful is, is uh, the, the element of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So there's, so we actually have on our performance review, you know, basically what, you know, what have you done to promote diversity, equity, inclusion as an individual, right? Which, and that could mean attending events on campus, uh, you know, listening to getting training, formal training, going to webinars, um, uh, participating on committees, that kind of thing. So the goal is to, you know, ultimately we want this to be so normalized that it's not on a performance review. It's not on, it's not something that we have to talk about. It's just something that we do as part of the culture. Um, so we're just starting to, and I think it's wonderful, hold people more accountable to engaging in this. And, um, you know, we have five generations in the workforce now and not everybody is, you know, some people think it's a bunch of, you know, poppycock or whatever, right? Like they don't see a need for it. It's like, I don't need to be politically correct. I just come here to do my job, right? Well, we're saying the University of Michigan has these values. And so we expect you to demonstrate those values as well if you want to work here. And we want you to be part of the solution and not, and, and engage. And um, so we've really, I was talking, I was um, helping facilitate a discussion after our, our um, Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium on Monday of this past week. And people were talking about like, what, is this, what does this mean? What does this look like? And um, it was just really invigorating to hear people trying to make a difference, doing their part to make a difference. And it's just, it's just renewing, um, it's, just, it's just in that conversation, somebody was saying, well, I'm pretty new here and I don't really, I haven't really seen a lot of change. And, and I was like, oh, contraire mon frere, right? Like this is, this, we are in the midst of a cultural change. And I was saying, listen, to our unit, we're just in the midst of this change. I know where we were five years ago. I see where we're going now. And so many people are, of our employees are saying, you know, we're so grateful that we're talking about it. We're so grateful to get this training. We're so grateful that you're giving us the language and the tools so that we can talk to our coworkers about this and to say, you know, when you made that comment to me the other day or to us sitting, you know, at the lunch table, that really hurt my feelings. And I don't know if you realize it, but I'm one of the people that you talked about. Um, and, you know, we're giving them the tools to have these conversations. And it's just, um, yeah, there's always going to be people that are naysayers that, it, you know, that are going to be slow to to move along with this process that aren't going to be, that aren't going to buy into it. Um, but the majority of people in my experience have been, you know, this is a welcome change. We're finally, like, we're really reflecting the values of the organization and the values of the University of Michigan because, you know, people come here and they have University of Michigan on, on a pedestal. I know I did. I thought, oh, I'm just, I am amazed that I get to work for this incredible um, university and, and I don't want to work anywhere else. Like higher ed is, is home for me. So to be a part of this and to affect change and to see um, people really responding on their performance reviews and, and recognizing that this isn't just something that they're going to have a quick answer to, that they're going to actually have to demonstrate, especially at, if they're a supervisor or manager, they have to lead by example. We're expecting them to lead by example, and we're going to hold them accountable, and it's going to affect their performance review. Shocker, right? When it when it affects people's money, money, they're a little bit more motivated, you know, to to um, to make changes. 
Yeah, and and that's what I was just gonna say. Like, it sounds like it's a good thing, and it in a larger unit, you know, means a lot. And as you said, there's five different generations in the workforce, you know, and as each generation comes along, you know, viewpoints will be different. So I think that that's everything I have specifically to ask you. Is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners? I just wish that it's so hard to explain. Um, maybe it's a genetic thing that I always felt like I needed to give back, that I had more to do to give back to the community, to give back to the world, to, to, to make a difference. And, you know, when I, when I look back at our family and I think about my, my aunt, your grandmother, cause uh, surprise audience where we're cousins, <laughs> her dad is my, is my, uh, is my first cousin. And, um, and they, you know, um, Betty, they, they did uh, uh, food banks, right? That's, that's one of the memories that I have. I'm sure she did other things with uh, a lot of volunteering with Catholic Social Services and everything. And um, I have a niece on the, on the other side of my family, nieces who have done uh, missionary work. And one of them started an after-school program for um, underserved kids with, so she helps with their, their education, with tutoring and providing a safe place for them. And I see like throughout our family, like you doing this amazing podcast, which is the coolest thing. I mean, you have to understand that is so wicked cool. And I am just in awe of you for having the courage to do it. And you do it with such grace. And, you know, we all, like our family, it's like it's in our blood to do do something to make a difference in the community and to make a difference in people's lives and to you know to affect change and that's you know that's was instilled in me i don't know where it came from right i i don't know but it's just part of who i am and i just and i'm just so grateful for that and i hope that i can instill that in my children as well so yeah, and and you're right. It is very much uh, in our families, and um, you know, I see it in some of my aunts and uncles, specifically in what they're doing, and like a lot of my cousins. Like we went through Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, and mm-hmm. um, even just like a couple years ago, I I literally said to my boyfriend, like, I want to be more involved with my community. Like I feel like you know, I'm just kind of I'm going through work. You know, I've got these things on the side, but I, I want to be involved, and that turned into me doing way too much. <laughs> um, but it, but it, you know, I liked it. And, you know, with the pandemic, things have changed a lot. Sure. Um, and, and I've loved doing this podcast and to, to hear you say those nice words, it's, it's thank you. Um, sure. But I love, you know, hearing the different stories and, and getting an opportunity to, to have other people listen. And, and I, I think it is very good to, to hear new things. And um, I've certainly been enjoying it. And even just the conversations it has sparked um, with my parents when I talk to them and and hear their thoughts, because it is very generationally different. So so thank you for that. Sure. Now, as you know, with all of my guests, I ask a random question at the end. I'm just kind of to end it out on a little bit something different. So my question for you is when the pandemic is over and you can freely go wherever you want, where do you want to go with your family? What do you want your kids to experience? Wow. What a great question. I think, you know, my immediate reaction is I want to take them to the park, right? So they can run and play on the, on the equipment and just, you know, get their energy out and just have fun because it's been so hard for them to not, you know, there's a little, there's a little park in our subdivision and they, you know, we drive by it and you can just see the, you know, the sad look on their face when we drive by and we're like, no, you can't, you know, cause we're not going to run out there with Clorox wipes and wipe everything down before you touch it. And uh, so it's just, I know that's parents, right? So it, that's, that was my immediate reaction, but more than that, I think on a bigger scale, we would love to be able to, you know, take a family vacation and just be able to go someplace and be free and not have to worry about um, a, a mask or get, you know, being exposed. And hopefully at some point that this pandemic will be just like the flu, we'll get the flu shot, we'll get the COVID-19, you know, shot and we'll all be protected, you know, for the most part. Um, but yeah, I would, my immediate reaction is I would, I just, we just want to take them to the park, <laughs> let them play. <laughs> right. So. 
simple things. All right, that brings this episode to a close. And, you know, if you would like to learn a little bit more about uh, foster, the foster system and would like to talk with Amy directly, you are more than welcome to just reach out to me through my podcast email and I will get you in touch with her. She has definitely talked with other people about her experience and, you know, the different things that she's gone through. And of course, every state is different. Um, every county, you know, it's it's different everywhere. Um, but there are places online that you can go and just kind of take that first step. But she is willing back with you if you want to reach out through me i'm happy to facilitate those conversations into happening and i will also be leaving in the description the book that amy mentioned uh that she teaches her class off of to kind of give a little bit more there with that because it's always good to have additional resources to learn from and of course if you would like to uh interact with the podcast on social media we are on facebook instagram and linkedin So, you know, go give those pages a follow and keep in touch. And if you'd like to guest on the podcast, you can send me an email as well. I always enjoy getting to hear from different people. And it was so great to hear from Amy. You know, as we mentioned at the end, we are related, um, but it is a distant relationship. um, And because we don't live locally near each other, you know, I haven't seen her a ton, but it's been so much fun being able to catch up. So thank you. Amy, so much for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next week, bye. Thanks, Sarah. It's been wonderful. I, I, this was great. Thank you so much. Bye.